Territory Planning Commission. Anyone wishing to address the Commission tonight on an item which appears on the, the agenda, uh, please come up to the podium, sign your name and address, and uh, address your concerns. Uh, with that, we're going to uh, take roll call, subject to uh, the admonition, if you have any personal communication devices, please uh, turn them on vibrate or off. Can we call the roll, please? Mr. Edmonds. Here. Mr. Hudson. Here. Mr. Krent. Here. Mr. Maxwell. Here. Mr. Sanzika. Mr. Schultz. Here. Mr. Strat. Here. Mr. Tagle. Here. Mr. Ullman. Here. We have a quorum. The uh, next item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. It's been submitted to all of us. Uh, Mr. Schultz. Uh, move the agenda as prepared. Support by Mr. Strat. Any discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Krent? Yes. Mr. Maxwell? Yes. Mr. Schultz? Yes. Mr. Strat? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Mr. Ullman? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. The agenda is approved. Um, approval of the minutes of the August 23rd, 2011 meeting has been submitted. Um, anyone have any additions or corrections to the minutes? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve Mr. Schultz. Second. Second by Mr. Maxwell. A roll call, please, Mr. Savada. Mr. Krent? Yes. Mr. Maxwell? Yes. Mr. Schultz? Yes. Mr. Strat? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Mr. Ullman? Stain. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Item four is for public comments on items which are not in the agenda tonight. Anyone wishes to address us on something which is not on the agenda? Seeing no one, we'll go to the first special use request, which is a public hearing. It's file number SU388A, an expansion of an existing adult foster care small group home, from nine residents to 10 residents, which is located on the north side of Square Lake, east of Beach, specifically 2420 West Square Lake. Section 6, currently zoned R1A, which is one family residential district. Mr. Brannigan, is this yours? Yes, sir. Why don't you proceed? Yep, uh, Angel from Albania is a site that you're familiar with. Uh, this project was approved just recently. It actually was a existing facility, a small uh, home for a number of years leading up till now. And then uh, through a, a series of occurrences, they had expanded their facility, basically turned the garage into part of the building. and expanded it to beyond the capacity of a family home. And so they needed to come in and get a special use permit to become a group home, a small group home. They came to you guys, uh, we reviewed it, found that it was actually, you know, once surveyed, the site was actually short of uh, 10 residents because of the 4,000 square feet, I'm sorry, yeah, the 4,000 square feet of area for each resident requirement uh, of lot area. So when you did the calculation, they ended up with, you know, allowing 9.98 .9 residents or something. So. Of course, we had to permit only nine when we approved their special use permit because of that. Um, the conditions on the site are exactly the same. Technically, they could actually accommodate a couple more residents according to the state regulations and according to what they actually have there in terms of square footage of bedrooms and all that. But what they're requesting here is uh, 10, which basically is one more than you approved just a couple months ago. And uh, in order to facilitate that, they went uh, of their own um, you know, accord. After their original approval, they decided they wanted to try and pursue a variance. For the, from the lot area requirement. They did that and they were successful in that. Um, it was ended up being a 27 square foot variant. So it was, you know, uh, where 40,000 square feet were required, they, you know, had 39,000, you know, whatever. It was just very, very close. So they were granted that variance probably because it was basically mostly a surveying error. I mean, the site is supposed to be 200 by 200 and would have allowed uh, the 10 residents under normal circumstances. Uh, I don't think I probably need to go through each of the elements in my plan, how it meets the special use requirements and that as we just did that, you know, uh, 90 days ago, and it is identical. They, they, it's the same drawings, it's the same everything because the floor plan, the uh, parking situation, nothing changes with the accommodation of an additional resident on the site. You'll remember that when they were approved, uh, they were given their special use permit for the, the nine residents. We requested and were granted a, um, a new uh, obscuring uh, fence on the uh, east side of the building to obscure the trash and recycling area. Um, that's shown on the plans. I know that's a change. 
and um, you know some uh, little uh, bushes and things like that. But uh, basically, it's going to look the way that it does now. We've never received any complaints. It meets uh, at that time, and I still continue to maintain that it meets the special use requirements. It's a permitted use in the district. It's compliant with the master plan. The one additional resident uh, is not going to generate any notable additional traffic at most. You know, if, if a resident had a, a relative visiting them every day, it would add two vehicle trips, one vehicle trip in, one vehicle trip out. There's plenty of parking there, even if three, four, five residents have people visiting at the same time. And uh, as far as, as we understand, they've, uh, you know, they've been compatible with the neighborhood and will continue to be. So we would recommend that you approve the uh, revised new special use permit request, which would allow 10 residents rather than nine. Thank you. Any questions of Mr. Brannigan? If not, is the petitioner here? <clears throat> Good evening, Nathan Robinson with Horizon Engineering, representing the Goikas. I'd be happy hey, to answer any questions. Would you like to add to uh, what Mr. Brandon said? No. Any questions of the petitioner, Mr. Sabinov? Just for the record, uh, we have not received any uh, any correspondence from any of the neighbors, either in email or telephone call or people popping by. Nothing. Okay. Thank you. This is a public hearing, and we'll open up to uh, anyone who wishes to address us on this item, or anyone who wishes to do that. Seeing no one, will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board. Mr. Schultz? Can I ask a question first? Yes. Uh, Mr. Savinant, were the people within 300 feet re-noticed of this special hearing? Yes. So they were. Then I will start with resolve that special use approval for 10 residents in an adult <coughs> foster care small group home located on the north side of Square Lake and east of Beach at 2420 West Square Lake, Section 6 within the R1A Zoning District be granted. Support by Mr. Strat. Any discussion on the motion? If not, the roll call, please. Mr. Maxwell? Yes. Mr. Schultz? Yes. Mr. Strat? Yes. Mr. Tagle? Yes. Mr. Ullman? Yes. Mr. Edmonds? Yes. Mr. Hudson? Yes. Mr. Krent? Yes. Resolutions approved. Uh, thank you, gentlemen. Other business is the issue of our sustainable development checklist. Um, who's going to lead that discussion? Mr. Brannigan. That would be me again. The um, sustainable development provisions you saw a few months ago, you recall, and uh, we had a pretty in-depth discussion over a whole work study session with you about it, went through a lot of the different elements. We had forwarded it to you to uh, provide comment on as well, and I received digital comments back. and. Uh, met with you a few into you individually and spoke of the phone, email, et cetera, to provide some of your input. We then uh, made a series of minor revisions to the document based on your input, started to communicate some of that back to you, and then we decided to hold off on the agenda because city management wanted a chance to uh, review and comment on it. Um, there were no changes made to the document as a result of city management's involvement, so there's nothing uh, out of the blue here that was added to the document, but what was clarified was the process for um, adopting these regulations. Ultimately, it was decided that the uh, Sustainable Development Regulations uh, checklist, this document, would be uh, adopted at the City Council level. Um, so basically what we are looking for is a recommendation from the Planning Commission so that we can get it on an upcoming Council agenda and have them approve it. Uh, the, the ordinance uh, part of this obviously was already adopted as part of the Zoning Ordinance Rewrite. And this is merely a document that is meant to support that ordinance language, but it's called for in the ordinance. So this is a supporting <coughs> document that provides the framework. Um, does anybody have any questions about how it worked and all that? I mean, we went over it in some detail. As I mentioned, there's a sustainable design review committee. There's a process that they go through. They provide a recommendation to the, actually, they, they grant, a, you know, sort of a pre-qualified status to the project. And then it kind of acts as a variance throughout the final site or throughout all the way through final site plan, regardless of whether it's administrative or it's a special use or whatever. And then once the final site plan is approved, that uh, modification of standards is basically ratified uh, as a result of the, the final site plan. But um, there's just six areas in the ordinance right now where it applies. Uh, there's just a few things. Um, your input uh, brought us to a couple of changes, uh, some minor revisions. One was uh, we added language about other forms of renewable energy, uh, you know, just sort of a general open category about renewable energy. That was a result of Mr. Mr. Maxwell's input about other, uh, like fuel cells and other things that would possibly be considered alternative energy. Um, 
there was uh, we had clarification about eligible brownfield sites because of the unique status of Troy and how we treat brownfield sites as basically anything in town can become a brownfield site. Um, so we yeah we call upon uh, MDQ you know identify brownfield sites and then there's specific language in there about that. Um, we confirmed that we had a discussion about professional seals and whether or not professional seals would be pr uh, required during the pre-qualification uh, process before they've even submitted for site plan approval. It was decided by this group that no, at that point you don't need seals because obviously you're ultimately going to be approving a site plan that's going to show the details and that would be adopting it. So we clarified that professional seals weren't necessary at the pre-application stage. Um, obviously they are uh, for the site plan stage. And then we corrected a series of grammatical changes <coughs> and errors throughout the document here and there. One additional thing that I want to change in the document, Mr. Tegel brought it to my attention prior to the uh, meeting tonight, was there's a sort of an awkward bit of language in the very beginning of the document where we talk about a, um, a reduction or a modification. Basically what we're saying is that you can increase the amount of lot coverage beyond what's required. What it says in there is a reduction in the lot coverage requirement, you know, which is kind of a bad way of saying that. I mean, a reduction in the requirement, you know, to get, be more liberal actually means an increase in the percentage of lot coverage. So I'm just going to change that language to read, you know, an increase so that it's, it's more clear because it's, it's, it's sort of poorly worded and confusing as it is. But other than that, um, uh, there's uh, no additional changes I wanted to make to it. If you have any extra questions or anything like that or want to discuss it, uh, uh, please feel free. If not, um, we would uh, like to get a recommendation of approval from the Planning Commission so we could take it to the uh, Council for their adoption so we could start applying this. Any questions for Mr. Brannigan? Mr. Strand? I'd just like to commend you on the thoroughness of this as well. I think you did an excellent job and I'm glad that you also are flexible in terms of other possible energy saving devices such as passive or whatever. So uh, I think that's, uh, that's excellent that we're allowing that as well. But other than that, I think it's an excellent, excellent presentation. Well, are we ready for a resolution? Mr. Edmonds. Whereas the City of Troy zoning ordinance included a sustainable design option which is intended to promote environmentally sustainable and energy efficient design and development practices for the construction of new and the rehabilitation of existing buildings and sites within the city and whereas section 12.01 of the city of Troy zoning ordinance established the requirement of a separate sustainable development checklist and whereas the planning commission developed the sustainable development checklist therefore be it resolved the planning commission hereby recommends to city council that the sustainable development checklist be approved uh, second, Mr. Schultz. Any discussion on the resolution? If not, uh, rent the roll call, please. Mr. Schultz. Yes. Mr. Stratt. Yes. Mr. Tagle. Yes. Mr. Allman. Yes. Mr. Edmonds. Yes. Mr. Hudson. Yes. Mr. Krent. Yes. Mr. Maxwell. Yes. Thank you. Um, item seven is for public comments uh, for items on the current agenda. I think this is an academic exercise because there's no one in the audience, so we'll <laughs> pass that. Um, before the meeting started, uh, Brent chatted a little bit with me regarding if we had time tonight, and <laughs> it's been, what, 13 minutes? Uh, <laughs> Expired. Yeah, for the whole session. Uh, to maybe do some more discussion on the proposed uh, sign issue. Uh, if you're in agreement, uh, I think maybe we should spend a little time in general discussions. Uh, Brent, do you want to lead us, or uh, Mr. Brannigan, or how do you want to do that? Well, um, <laughs> I guess I can lead. There was, uh, I, I've, I continue to receive input from planning commissioners. Um, uh, Mr. Krent uh, provided me with uh, a PowerPoint presentation that I converted to a PDF and I e emailed to everybody. And um, Mr. Schultz dropped off some photographs this evening that I haven't had a chance to look at yet, but I will put that in an in emailable format and, and email everybody. Um, does anybody else plan to uh, send photographs or send ideas? I will. Yeah. The second kick of the can, Mr. Krent? Uh, different, different items. <laughs> and that's fine. I'm just I'm trying to multitask here and talk and bring up an ordinance at the same time. If you'd like, I'd, I'll just indicate what those two items are. That'd be great. Uh, one item is the uh, illegal signs in the uh, uh, right-of-way. 
Uh, these are the temporary, like uh, I'm a specific contractor sign uh, stating his phone number and you know they make granite countertops or whatever they do. And uh, my biggest complaint is this. I think the, uh, the ordinance right now is written uh, doesn't contain enough penalty to dissuade these people from doing it. Uh, basically, uh, the city or its volunteers take these signs out and the, uh, the fender is given a, a, a certain amount of time to retrieve that sign for a fee, but the fee, uh, they don't, all I'm saying is that the price of the sign is 250 and the fee, I believe, I don't know if somebody can correct me, I think it's like $45 or something. 50. 50, okay. And the point is, for a 250 sign, they're not gonna pay 50 bucks to get it back, so it's kind of silly to me. The, uh, a, a better way of handling it in my eye would be to, um, when, when the offender is, or when offending sign is, is located, uh, then the city official would contact that uh, offender and, and give, uh, give maybe a verbal warning and probably more, more than likely officially, uh, after going through legal, probably some kind of a certified document saying that uh, uh, they're in violation of the city ordinance and at that point, uh, I would like our new ordinance to specify uh, some kind of penalty or fine for every occurrence thereafter by that particular company or individual. Uh, because otherwise, they'll just keep doing it. And the other item I had uh, was regard to how we calculate square footage for larger signs, the ground signs. Uh, for years, uh, I've seen, I've been familiar with signs because I used to be a sign fabricator. and. Uh, the, uh, the one that I would like to see corrected is the, uh, the ability for a company to put, instead of a, a ground sign that's just stuck on one or two poles, which have a use and have a spot, but a lot of times uh, we'd like to see the sign reflect the architecture of the building. And in that case, I'd, the, you have these what we call monument signs. Basically, the entire base uh, is, is the pole. Uh, and it goes up sometimes equal to the side, uh, the the diam or the, the the width of the sign. Let's say. What happens under ordinance? I was talking over with uh, Paul Ev uh, Evans, is that um, that base would then be counted as square footage, which is, you know, we're telling a person you can put up a couple of steel poles which will rust in ten years and look like hell. But a beautiful granite monument sign, now you can't have it. <laughs> or if you do, it's going to be a really teeny sign. <laughs> I think that's uh, something that needs to be corrected. I contacted Brent also after I saw your, your PDF, Tom, and you touched on something that uh, I'd been thinking about, and that's with temporary signs. The length that we can keep a temporary sign up, and the first impression is temporary signs should be temporary up for a limited period of time and then taken down. And then thinking more about it, I got to thinking there's a great segment of our business community who sells real estate. And we all know the market, uh, a temporary sign uh, might have worked five, 10 years ago where it'd be up maybe 30 days, maybe 60 days. Today it's not unusual to see a, a two year before a premise is sold. And I'm concerned um, that's where Mr. Motsny is going to help us eventually, I think, as to whether or not we can put a limitation on a temporary sign for a business purpose and whether there's going to be any conflict with the United States Constitution's First Amendment freedom of speech. And I don't know how you solve that, but uh, I'd like us to kind of maybe do some considering and thinking about uh, how we might do that. Now, a temporary sign for a political office, by its nature, it's going to expire after an election, but. Uh, but for real estate or something of that nature, I think there's a quandary here. And uh, Mr. Krent also raised in his PDF a real good thing to think about, and that is how we've always encouraged signs to uh, be in the premises, advertising with some limitations. But with our requirements for landscaping, as trees and shrubs and bushes get bigger, it kind of obfuscates that sign. Uh, something else I think that we've got to think about. And those were a couple of my thoughts I had. And just to clarify what the ordinance says, it, it does place a time limitation on temporary sign. It says each temporary sign shall be removed within 60 days of placement. 
but theoretically, it, it doesn't tell you how many times a year you can place that sign. So theoretically, you, when it, on the 60th day, you pick it up and walk it and put it in your garage overnight and then go back and plunk it down the next day. I mean, that's, the, you know, that's kind of the logic behind it becoming essentially a, a permanent temporary sign. Yeah, that's a problem. Right. <coughs> Mr. Schultz? Um, I went through Tom's PowerPoint with great interest, and I agree that the trees could be a problem, but in driving down Big Beaver, Depending on the angle you're looking at them, some of them are obscured by trees, but at some point, every sign is totally legible. And I will not support reducing landscape requirements for the visibility of signs. It's not going to happen from this chair. And then I've told a couple of the people, and I'll relate this to the rest of the group, because we've all talked about um, trucks used for advertising. And on Labor Day Sunday, I had no power in the morning, I had no power all night actually. So in the morning I got up and went for a ride and started taking pictures. And one of the places was an establishment on Maple Road that uses trucks, <laughs> or what, which we have always contended uses trucks for advertising. Um, the interesting thing is there are three vehicles parked in front of that business. One of them has no license plate at all and a flat tire and rust running down from the tire or the rim onto the ground, so it's been there a while. The second truck, the license plate expired in 2007, and the third truck, the license plate expired in 2004. So to my way of thinking, not only are they using the signs for or trucks for advertising, they're also running a junkyard on Maple Road, <laughs> which I'm sure is against the zoning ordinance. So uh, that's just an observation I made and I think I gave Brent almost four dozen pictures today of various signs most of them from one area of the city so uh, but I basically got tired of taking pictures so I went back home and the power was on. Mr. Strat? Yeah it was very interesting that Tom uh, took pictures of the interior of the one truck how ratty it was, et cetera, that one with the cigars and everything else. I was shocked to see the interior in such a bad shape, but it doesn't surprise me that Mr. Schultz has uh, discovered all that as well. But I also agree with Mr. Schultz with respect to landscaping. I would not, I would not uh, certainly sacrifice landscaping of trees, et cetera, that we're trying to create uh, for the signage. Now, I know that uh, Tom had indicated and shown, uh, uh, it happened to be my neighbor's uh, photograph of my neighbor's sign, and unfortunately, the neighbor that built that sign built it quite some time ago, maybe 20, 30 years ago. But that sign had an option. That identical sign could be one foot from the property line. The setback is set back quite a ways. Didn't have to be. So therefore, the landscaping has nothing to do with the signage. The signage, there are options, but some of the signage that we have are obsolete signs as far as location. And it's not the fault of the zoning ordinance, and it's not the fault of the landscaping. Maybe the landscaping outgrew the sign or the location as far as visual, but they had an option. And they could have had a ground sign, and it could be low. It doesn't have to be. Uh, because uh, trees, you know, they, they, the foliage is uh, giving an umbrella, but they're single little spindles. So that they're not obs uh, obscuring the sign to that extent, in my opinion. Mr. Santa. The, um, the PowerPoint that uh, Tom put together was, was, was excellent. I mean, I appreciate, I know that it must have taken you hours to put that together. And um, you raised some, some valid points. And I don't disagree with the conflict between the landscaping and the signage. I think we'd all agree that you know, trees grow and foliage, you know, expands. The problem with, um, I should not want to say problem, the reality with uh, handling that issue through the sign ordinance is because it's not uh, part of the zoning ordinance, you know, we can, there's no grandfathering. So theoretically, we could, we could enforce on, a, you know, depending on how strict the provisions are, we could theoretically enforce on a, on a property owner whose foliage obscures the signage. So, you know, we could approach them and say, you know, you've got to take your tree down or you've got to, you know, replace this tree with, land, with, with a, a more appropriate species or what have you. My point being that it's, I, th I think 
it's very important, uh, you know, let's say there's a, there's a, pro a property that's, that, that there's nothing on it, and they're planning to put the signage and the landscaping. Obviously, this, this is, helps raise awareness, and it, it's uh, something that the de designer should think about in, in terms of what plants you're going to put there, because 20 years from now, those plants could have a negative impact on the signage. Um, so that's, they can design, you know, pick appropriate plant species and locations and whatnot. The, where it comes into play is, is where it is, wh what happens today. And, and, you know, do we enforce? Do we, you know, what do we do about these, these obscuring plants? Um, and I don't expect an answer. I'm just saying that the reality is there's an, you know, it, I, what I don't want to do, and I don't think we need to do, is create an ordinance that we can't, create a provision we can't enforce. Or we don't want to enforce. Maybe we want to enforce, but if we do enforce, we're going to irritate a lot of people. And uh, so I guess there's a, there's a balancing act there. But, but your point is well taken. The, the relationship between landscaping and signage is very important, especially you know, when you're, before you put it, put it all in, you have, and you have a chance to, to design it so it, there's, not, there's no negative impact of the signage on the landscaping or vice versa. And if I can ask, add a second. Uh, sure. Look. Regarding the temporary signage, um, what, we, what we can add in there, and, and Alan, he knows way more about the First Amendment than I do. Um, but what we can do is if, if we treat all, all signs the same and we put a limitation on how many times per year you can have this 60-day temporary sign, you know, two or three or four, whatever that number is, I think that may be a way around, a, a way to eliminate some of these temporary signs that just seem to linger forever. You know, put a, put a cap on how many times a year you can do this, regardless of what type of sign it is. So we're not... We're not, just, we're not just selectively saying, well, you, you can have a political sign for this long, but not a real estate sign, or vice versa. Treat every, every sign the same. Mr. Edmonds. The, um, the situation with the trees, you know, the limbs covering that, actually there's a solution that I would think most of the business people would, would want to make sure that their sign was visible, but trees, uh, so many trees, need to just be limbed up. <laughs> and we, we saw that over at some of the... Um, uh, Midtown Square, you know, when we were on the tour that one time, and so many of those, remember those uh, crab apples, they were really low, and either that or, or have an ordinance that says you've got to be at least six to eight feet so people can walk along the sidewalk anyway to, to uh, get, get passed through, so. Yeah. Mr. Schultz. Well, I would just, just in, I, I agree with you, but there are some species that you just, like if it's a spruce tree, you know, if you, if you limit up too far, it, looks like an umbrella and it's really not a spruce tree anymore. So there, some species are just, you're kind of stuck with the problem, you know, in, you know, just the type of tree it is. Mr. Schultz. What you just said about temporary signs and possibly going with, you know, 60 days, four times a year or something like that. There are hundreds of buildings in this city right now that have real estate signs in front of them. So are we saying that that realty company is going to have to come out and remove that sign four times a year in order to keep it in front of the building. It gets it gets back to having provisions in the ordinance. You, I mean, do you want to selectively enforce some provisions but not other ones? I would I would suggest that what you want to do is you want to have an ordinance that the city agrees upon, and you want to enforce all provisions equally and not not. Uh, adopt an ordinance with provisions that you want to ignore. I, I, I totally agree, but I also am a huge advocate for trying to fill the tens of thousands of square feet of empty space in this city and to put an obstruction between doing that and the person that owns the building and the realtor I think is counterproductive. Mr. Strath. I have an office building that 50% is vacant. It's costing me $10,000 a month. And I'll be damned if I'm going to let that sign ordinance go away without having that real estate sign in front there. I'd fight it like tooth and nail. I mean, that's my livelihood. That's costing me a lot of money. Uh, everything else I don't care about, but that real estate sign, I'd beg every realtor to come in here and, and fight for that. I think that's horrible. Uh, there are a lot of, like Mr. Schultz just said, we've got a very high vacancy rate right now, and it's costing the city, the city a lot of money in terms of taxes that they're losing as well. 
I mean, we're, we're, we're defeating ourselves. We're trying to raise the level or raise our bar, but that's not the way to do it, I don't think. Maybe policing it, making sure that they're maintained, because Tom showed some excellent examples of some of the signs that were really pretty battered, and they really needed to be fixed up, but that's something else. But I think the signs should stay. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit. That's all right. <laughs> This was not a uh, session that uh, was going to make any decisions, I and mean, we just thought maybe if we had time, we'd try and fill it with some more thoughts uh, on signs in general. Mr. Tegel. Tom, I have a question for you. Um, I'm not sure um, if the real estate signs are a problem because of their location. Would you be objectionable if the signs were, like, say, on the inside of your window of your building as opposed to a sandwich board sign or a pole sign out in the right of way. Because I guess what I'm getting at is I really understand the, the dilemma of enforcing uh, four times a year or wh whatever that may look like, but I also understand the importance of allowing people to be aware that there's a building for sale or, or space uh, for lease. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, I, I also wonder in my head too, how many people actually become interested in the space because they're driving around without some information from a realtor to begin with? I don't know. But I'm just, I guess, asking you a question because you're, you're in a unique situation from all of us here. Would that be something that would be acceptable to you as opposed to, and I don't even know what your, if your sign is on your building or if it's out in front of your well, you building? You saw it, but anyway. But that's all you need is one person to drive by. That's all you need, one person to observe it out of maybe the thousands and say, hey, I'm interested in call their realtor up or call that realtor up, because it does happen. I understand. But and, and really, you're, you're, you know, you have a good point, because really, the real estate signs are there for publicity, or they're, they're using it as a part of a promotion of themselves, too. Uh, there's no question about that. But from a selfish point of view, hey, I only need one tenant, and that's all I'm after. You know, and I guess the point is, if we were to develop an ordinance that required the signs to be more integrated within the building, if they're all like that, then one realtor won't have an advantage over another realtor that his sign's out in front and somebody else is on the building. Just some food for thought. See, my, my point with that is this, that I'm interested in controlling and lifting the bar up, and I'm looking at other communities. What are the other communities doing? Well, they're controlling the color of the signs. Mm -hmm. They're controlling the signs, but right now we have a hodgepodge. We have no control, no control whatsoever. And, and Tom had an excellent example of one of the signs that had 45 different advertisements on there, all different colors, and it was, it was a hodgepodge. It was just an eyesore. That was visual pollution. And, and that's the kind of thing that we really need to control is that kind of a situation, more so than anything else, or the colors. You go to Bloomfield Township, Now I don't want to be picking on any particular area, but they have a board, and they, when you put up a sign, whether it's permanent or otherwise, and it doesn't have to be just on the lawn, anywhere's in your building, anywhere's in your premise, you go before the board, and you have to show them what the colors are. And I'll be darned if they don't come out and make an inspection when they do make the inspection when it's up, and it better be that color. I had a situation where it was slightly off, and, and they, they, they called me on it. Mm -hmm. But that is really, love, you know, raising the bar. But, you know, I know that Zach is, is talking about, you know, having a, a committee for the, uh, you know, the, the environmental. And I, I, that's raising the bar to me, anyway. Mr. Sevenant. How do I put this? In, in these economic times and this kind of the reality that we've got with re reorganization and restructuring to, um, to create an additional board and, a, and a, an additional layer of review, I don't know if that's really realistic and, and you know, it's kind of counter to trying to fast, fair and predictable. You know, it's, it's another step, it's another layer and it's another agenda that has to be prepared and minutes taken and notice provided and you know web web page provided et cetera. it's it's more review when we're trying to you know to become less so i don't disagree with the concept but i think the reality is 
I don't know if we want to be, you know, introducing another another border committee. Just, you know. Mr. Ullman, did you? Um, I have to agree with Mr. Strat. Having been in a situation once upon a time looking for uh, some property to operate a business on, it was easier at the beginning at least just to get in a car and go to the appropriately zoned area and drive around and see what's there. You know, if somebody had a vacant lot and there wasn't a sign on it, you didn't have any indication that they were interested in renting or selling it. I think the simple thing here is to create exemptions like real estate signs. I think real estate signs are just absolutely necessary in order to uh, make it easy to get tenants and buildings. Mr. Schultz. Uh, <clears throat> to expand or weigh in on, on John's suggestion of a, an outdoor sign versus a sign in a window, we have a lot of little one-story buildings in Troy, and if the street frontage of that building has a tenant and two-thirds of it is empty in the back, if I'm that street tenant, I'm not going to be real happy if the landlord comes in and puts a for rent sign inside the window of, of my building for, for the space that I'm paying rent for. So I think pers at first blush, I'm thinking that the sign is going to have to be outside um, visible from the road because if I'm paying rent for the front 10,000 square feet of a building and the back 20,000 is empty, I'm not going to want a sign plastered in the window of my business <coughs> the landlord has a building for rent. Mr. Stemmett. I guess I'm going, to, I'm going to put Alan on the spot here a little bit. When if we were, Alan, if we were to um, regulate real estate signs and give them an ex, a, a kind of an exemption from, um, from timing requirements, however, not give an exemption to a political sign, it, what's the danger in that? I should probably backtrack. Some of you may remember a number of years ago, uh, we got sued, the, the city did, and we lost it based on our political sign provisions because we had time limits on political signs. And that's actually where this temp our current temporary sign language came from because the court said uh, we were treating signs differently uh, in violation of equal protection. Uh, you can't treat signs differently if you have some rational basis for doing so unless treating them differently affects a fundamental right. And, and um, Mr. Hudson, I'm sure, knows all this, but in the political sign, they said treating political signs differently affected the fundamental right of freedom of speech. And the court said, the city can't treat political signs differently unless it has uh, uh, some, um, uh, you had to have a compelling governmental reason for doing so. And so that was why at that point we just said all temporary signs will, will be treated equally. That way we won't get a challenge. Now, can you treat a real estate sign differently? The answer is maybe. Uh, but first you have to decide, I mean, we, you would have to justify it in the ordinance and you would have to indicate uh, why you're treating the real estate signs differently and you would have to explain that this does not affect a fundamental right and if you could explain that away, if you had some rational basis for treating those signs differently, uh, then in theory you could pass an ordinance treating them differently. But course, it'd be subject to challenge, and, and so you have to be very careful what language you use, and you'd have to explain and justify why you're treating one type of temporary sign differently than others. And if the, the ultimate answer is if the court says there's a rational basis for doing so, and it doesn't affect any fundamental right, then we could get away with it. So I know that's not a simple explanation, but I'm just, that's the, that's the reason why it's, it's difficult to treat different types of signs differently because you have to justify it. Uh, Mr. Edmonds and Mr. Strand. Uh, of all these uh, examples of signs that, you know, some of the commissioners found objectionable, were any of them uh, illegal and, and what was done about them or what percentage of them? 
Uh, I don't know if I can answer that. I haven't looked at, this, at the photos lately, and I didn't look, to, look at them with that question in mind. Um, there, were, there were some, you know, that were, I, I, I couldn't put a, a percentage on them, uh, on, the, on the figure. Uh, there were some temporary signs that looked like they were illegal, illegally placed or um, exceeded the, you know, the square footage requirements. I, I don't know what percentage, though. There were, there were a number of them. And it just as a follow-up, the reason I bring that up is my, my greatest concern is that we're going to change the sign ordinance so much that it's going to be unenforceable. And I think we already have some provisions that are being enforced. So that's my whole, whole, point. That's my whole point. Mr. Strand? Yeah, my only comment is that, you know, I, I really, there are some communities I really enjoy working with because I know what the rules are and they don't deviate and they don't, uh, uh, they're very, very consistent and that's the important thing is being consistent. And whatever you're doing, you have to be consistent. And once you know what the rules are, that's fine. You can work within those rules. You know you can and you know you're going to get your approval. I mean, that, that's the name of the game and I, I can really sympathize what you're, what you're talking about in terms of the administrative problems associated with having some sort of a control board or four or five people or whatever it may be. And there, in that case, I think there's five people that uh, actually uh, review all the signs. And, uh, you know, to me that, that's very, very simple, but I know what the rules are and I have no problems in going into that community or any community for that matter, as long as I know. But when there's flexibility and there's, they, they deviate, that's when you're really in trouble. And I'm sure that John can recognize that too. I mean, he's worked with various municipalities as well. That's my only point. Mr. Krent. Yeah, the, uh, again, talking about the real estate signs, what I, what I guess the, the strongest point I wanted to point out is that we've got business owners that invest literally thousands of dollars in a permanent sign, and they require a permitting process and a permitting fee and a license and insurance, and the temporary signs have none of those requirements. Matter of fact, their setback is, as I, I, when I talked to Paul Evans, there is no setback requirement for a, for a real estate sign, whereas a permanent sign has certain spe specific setbacks, 10 feet, 20 feet, whatever it is, depending on the size of the sign. My, my problem with that is I feel the businesses that make this large investment in a permanent sign are, are being disserviced by the city by, by having temporary signs put up and blocking their expensive signs. Maybe we can resolve that with the, a setback for real estate signs. Maybe they should be at least equal to the permanent signs, if not even more so, so they don't block neighboring signs. Mr. Edmonds? Yeah, and a further complication, I, I, at the time I didn't think too much of it, but I, I think Paul mentioned that a lot of these appeals that come from businesses, the Building uh, Board of Appeals typically uh, approves uh, all the, uh, the folks who uh, want come to come before them for changes. So, and I think that gets back to Mr. Uh, Strat's point that I think you need consistency and, and uh, you know, it ought to be even-handed across it. I know, I, I seem to remember what, what a difference it made on the, the uh, BZA committee when after we had the, uh, the legal review uh, before that, BZA was approving practically everything. Yeah. Right after that, things changed dramatically. So, uh, I think I agree. I, I agree with Tom with it. We really do need consistency. Mr. Chairman, see the situation that you mentioned, uh, Tom, as it relates to the uh, that sign <coughs> that you were originally talking about is that that sign was put in maybe 20, 30 years ago. And that setback is way, way back. It could have been right one foot from there. But at the time, there were no other buildings around when that building was built. So it's not everybody else's fault. It's the people that are designing the sign that I saw of, your, of all the examples that you should, where they had pylon signs going up when they should have been horizontal underneath the landscaping, underneath the trees. It's the designers that sometimes are really at fault, more so than the locations or the trees or landscaping. They should know better. 
Mr. Maxwell. I just wanted to mention uh, one of the big concerns I have going forward is uh, due to advances in technology and personal taste. And I, I really think there could be a proliferation of multimedia type signs, uh, even using LED technology today. Uh, I've been investigating some of this uh, recently. And I'm noticing that the, the cost of LED technology is really going down. And it is possible, even for a small business or even a, a private uh, residential owner, to come up with a fairly substantial sign that is multimedia, that has video on it, that has multi messages, has photos, whatever, mix it all together. And it can be solar powered, controlled by a computer. It can be done very inexpensively. I think the, uh, because that technology is going down in cost and has an attractiveness, especially to younger people, that we should be aware of that. I, I think more people will go in that direction. Because uh, it, instead of buying a permanent sign where you have to change letters every week, you could just go to your computer, change the sign 50 times a day if you want to, and plus throw in video or whatever you want. So I, I really think uh, we're going to see more of that uh, due to uh, the advances of technology, re reduction in cost, and you should be aware of that. Yeah, we just about plumb the well dry tonight. Mr. Edmonds? Just with the one stipulation, Mr. Maxwell, yeah. I, I think the, uh, the intensity of, or whatever you call it, the contrast or the brightness mm -hmm. has to definitely be controlled. Right, the uh, size. You could uh, look at a uh, number of messages, types of messages, the size of the sign in the first place, and the brightness of it. Some of the things, right. Okay, seeing no other bright ideas. Uh, <laughs> coming up. <laughs> We do have one last item, if anyone wants to partake, and that's uh, Planning Commission comments. Mr. Stratt? Mr. Edmonds? I just have one comment, or one uh, question for Mr. Monsey. I noticed at the council meeting last night that the tr Transit Center contract was uh, <clears throat> approved, and I'm just curious, has there still been anything done with the lawsuit or any, any further progress? Uh, no. Um, the. Uh, Grant Sacqua filed a motion for reconsideration, and it's just sitting there. Uh, the judge ordered us to file a reply to the motion, which we did, but there's no, for whatever reason, the court rules don't put any time limitation on the, the judge deciding a motion for reconsideration. And the problem with that is, is it extends their appeal period because they could file an appeal within 21 days after the decision on the motion for reconsideration. So. Nothing's happening. The really, I'm sorry, <laughs> the, the real complicating factor now is that uh, facility with the signing of the contract has to be uh, built and ready in two years. So if this lawsuit's going to drag out, <laughs> you know, where are we at? Uh, I suppose at some point we would have to maybe file a motion to get the judge to make a decision to, to force her hand. <clears throat> Thank you. Mr. Ullman? Um, some comments were forwarded to me uh, for the project on John R. South Long Lake Road. The big question was, you know, they cut down a lot of trees, which we knew they were going to do. But the question was asked, what happened to our tree ordinance? Is something else coming? Um, we were supposed to have some kind of ordinances moving forward for natural features and such. Where are they? I, I don't know what ordinances you're talking about. What, what ordinances are you, are you referring to? Well, originally there, was some, there were some provisions for some natural features protection in, I think, Section 10, and then they were taken out, and it was supposed to become a separate section or another ordinance. Because right now we don't have any tree protection whatsoever. Is something being put together in regard to tree protection? No, I don't know what, what provisions you're referring to. Well, I, I find that kind of interesting because I know the council instructed staff to prepare that and we haven't seen anything. Honestly, I, I, I'm, I'm lost as to what you're referring to. Well, we had some language in the zoning ordinance in, I think it was May, and then when it came back with the, the final version, it had been deleted. It was stated at that time that was going to be in a separate section that was going to be prepared later. So effectively, the tree ordinance that we had is now gone, and we don't have any tree protection at all. 
and these residents were pretty upset that we just continue to clear cut every tree that's left in Troy. I mean, look at the corner down here uh, where you come in uh, off Livernoy in here. At one time you couldn't see through the trees and now it's just a field. And the residents were uh, quite appalled that we don't have any kind of tree protection whatsoever. So we just don't have, we don't protect anything. Is that where we are today? Mr. Brannigan, can you answer that? I mean, I can help. We, we did not have uh, tree mitigation or replacement in our ordinances ever, uh, uh, sir. We, we, we never actually had that at all, Mr. Ullman. So the draft uh, that we prepared, the original draft of Article 10 of the zoning ordinance had some initial language that would kind of steer towards a higher level of natural features protection than we used to have with regards to tree replacement. But throughout the process of uh, you know, soliciting input from elected officials, appointed officials, various things, it was dialed back to basically keep the status quo with regards to tree protection that was in the previous ordinance. So there is not a reduction in tree protection as a result of the new ordinance. It is at the same level that it always was, which is essentially we do not have a tree for tree replacement requirement in the Troy zoning ordinance, nor have we ever had such a requirement. So it's not a reduction, it's just that we did not increase them as a result of the new zoning ordinance. Now, there was consideration at the time of ultimately, if the city wanted to pursue an enhanced level of natural features protection, we could do that through a natural features protection ordinance. But to my knowledge, and I can tell from Brent's reaction, <coughs> Brent's knowledge or the planning department's knowledge, there was not a specific instruction from council to move forward with preparing any sort of natural features protection ordinance. It was merely one of many things that could be considered. We knew that there was gonna be necessary changes to a host of ordinances that exist on the books like the sign ordinance. And actually Brent and I came up with a list of 37, I think ordinances of the cities that need to be amended as a result of the zoning ordinance adoption because of references to provisions that don't exist anymore in that. You know, in addition to that, if uh, there's other things that the Planning Commission wants to, uh, to you know, consider or request that the City Council consider, you know, we had talked about, uh, you know, wetlands protection and stuff enhanced above and beyond what, you know, state regulations are or whatever. But um, to my knowledge and to, to, I'm sure to Brent's knowledge, there was no specific instruction in that regard to move forward with such. But I can tell you that we didn't remove any tree protection that used to exist as a result of the new ordinance. It's basically just the same as it always was. I understand all it essentially did was we marked the trees and we went in and cut them down. So it was just kind of a useless motion. So I understand yeah. that. What we added uh, what from where we used to have before was, yeah, an enhanced level of uh, um, documentation over existing natural features that's there. But it stopped short, and it does stop short um, uh, of providing any formal mitigation requirement. What we had talked about at the time, if my memory serves, was that the new ordinance, it's, it's, it's sort of a halfway measure because what the ordinance does do is require uh, enhanced new landscaping, regardless of what you tore down, it requires a much higher level of uh, site landscaping for, for new construction or renovation than it used to. So we have lots of, uh, we have lots of legally existing nonconformity around the city with regards to landscaping now. And uh, any new projects that are coming in are having to do basically double the landscaping they would have had to under the old ordinance. But um, yeah, we talked a lot about it because I remember there's like, well, you know, most of our sites are redevelopment sites, you know, that kind of thing. We don't have too many of those residential type projects where there's greenfield lots, not discounting it, but that was, I remember that was all part of the discussion at the time. Mr. Schultz. Uh, just one more comment on signs. All right. We have two new temporary signs in the city. And I'm very happy to see them, and those are the signs that were put up just very recently for Granite City going in at the PNC Center. They're right out on Big Beaver Road, uh, offering employment, and has a big picture of what the restaurant's going to look like, so I think that's kind of exciting. Even if it is a temporary sign. That's right. <laughs> Mr. Print? Mr. Maxwell? No comment. Mr. Hagel? I have none. Brent? No comment. Al? Nothing? You want a shot at it? Uh, uh, just really quick, I will say, uh, Brent and I spent a few hours today driving around town uh, doing visual documentation of projects that had been approved and had gone all the way through final site plan and through to construction over the last about two and a half, three years. And uh, it was kind of fun. I mean, we drove the city from top to bottom and looked at everything from some reoccupations like the Elks Club, you know, and some of them that were 
sort of so-so minor window dressing all the way up to the big ones like Axel Tack. We took photos of Spa Renaissance and everything like that, and it was kind of fun. Uh, you know, we're starting to try to do, you know, sort of positive reinforcement, look at everything that's gone on. We even went to Capitol Grill, looked at all the outdoor cafes, took photos, and started to document them. So it's, um, you know, it was just sort of encouraging to, like, spend a day looking at all the positive things that have taken place over the last couple of years. And, you know, we looked at the list of uh, 2010 and 11 approvals and all the stuff that's sort of pending right at the final site plan level, and there's going to be another series of things that'll drop um, that'll start to be constructed that you guys have approved and looked at. So hopefully that will continue in a positive way. So good job. Good. With that, we're adjourned. Very good.